Good evening, everyone. Tafodjeroiv, Kalispera, Abdodovlino. I'd like to welcome you all to our sixth Zoom event in the Irish Linux Society since certain events happened a year ago now. And just in case you were trying to readjust your computer, uh, what you were listening to was part of a work called Palace of Ships by David Stalling. And if you'll bear with us for the next hour or so, uh, you'll be able to see, having heard the audio, you'll be able to see the video with the audio after our, our event this evening. And uh, having just spoken to our speaker, uh, she agreed that uh, it was very appropriate for what she's going to be talking about. Just to remind you that all of our Irish Hellenic Society events, including this one after a few days, uh, when it's edited, will be uh, and are, are available and will be available um, on our YouTube channel. And you can see that by just going into YouTube and doing a search for the words Irish Hellenic Society. In 2016, five years ago now, Klo uh, Irchonucht and Blood Axe Books uh, published a wonderful anthology of 20th century Irish, po Irish poetry called Ljaur Nahagavala, Poems of Repossession. And the poems were selected and edited by, edited by Louis de Puer. And that publication included uh, the, the poem which uh, our speaker is going to be talking about tonight, uh, which itself was published in 1964 in a book called Lux Eterna. It was translated by Colbert Kearney in a wonderful translation, and that allowed our speaker, who doesn't have Irish, access to this wonderful work, which is probably the most important work of poetry on a world scale written in the Irish language in the, in the 20th century. And we're very, very fortunate this evening to have as our speaker, Dr. Natasha Raimundu, who is a native of Athens and who's been living in the West of Ireland since uh, 2003. She's a lecturer in English literature in drama and critical theory at the International Honours Programme of the American College of Greece in Athens. She's held academic positions as a research fellow at the Moore Institute in the National University of Ireland in Galway, as an assistant professor of English um, literature at the University of Qatar, and as a lecturer in NUI Galway. And her recent ex uh, research explores classical, particularly Greek influences on contemporary Irish literature, especially drama. And there's a huge amount of uh, influence from the Greek tragedians on, uh, on Irish drama in recent years, especially as these intersect with rights, particularly human rights, but not exclusively to human rights. She's also in her own right, a poet, a writer and a translator. And she's going to be assisted this evening by two of her colleagues who have very kindly agreed uh, to, to help her out with the Irish end of things, um, both of whom are colleagues from the National University of Ireland in Galway, Dr. Riona Niril and Leisha Nikistula. And uh, she will be asking them uh, after a few minutes to read part of the work that we're going to be discussing. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Natasha Ramundu, please. Uh, good evening to all from County Mayo. Thank you so much, uh, Paddy, for this warm introduction. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Καταρχάς, θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω στα ελληνικά πρώτα θερμά τον Ιρλανδο Ελληνικό Σύνδεσμο Ιρλανδίας και τον πρόεδρό του, τον κύριο Πάτρικ Σάμον, εσένα, uh, Πάντι, για την φιλοξενή απόψε και για το γεγονό ότι βρίσκομαι μαζί σας είναι μεγάλη μου τιμή. Να ευχαριστήσω επίσης τον κύριο Θοδωρή Γιούτο για την τεχνική φροντίδα που κάνει εφικτή την, απο... την αποψινή μας διαδικτυακή συνάντηση. Και βέβαια να ευχαριστήσουμε και τους φίλους μας που μας παρακολουθούν απόψε, δίνουν το χρόνο τους και μας βλέπουν από την Ελλάδα, από την Ιρλανδία, αλλά και από άλλα μέρη του κόσμου. So first of all, I would like to thank the Irish Hellenic Society and its president, Mr. Patrick Salmon. That is you, Paddy. Thank you very much uh, for this warm introduction and hospitality. It is indeed a great honor to be uh, here with you all tonight. And I want also to extend my thanks to Mr. Todoris Yutos for the technical support that makes this event possible. And uh, above all, I want to thank our viewers, our friends who are watching uh, from Ireland, from Greece, and from uh, elsewhere, from other parts of the wor world. Uh, at the focus of our online gathering tonight uh, is Eugene Waters, uh, as you already know, uh, you heard from Paddy mentioning, uh, the Irish poet, playwright, critic, translator, author and educator, Eugene Waters, who also is known by the name of Owen Othurish, 
uh, under which name he chose to publish his works in the Irish language and which he fully adopted later in his career. Uh, we are also going to be looking at one a specific poem of his, also mentioned by Paddy, um, Arthur Namur in Irish. Um, uh, many of you will wonder why are we um, talking about waters tonight. There are many reasons, a myriad of reasons why we're talking about waters. Um, one of them for me that is very important for me is that he remains unknown uh, to many, um, including the general Greek uh, reading public. And I feel this is an occasion for us to get to know his extraordinary work. Uh, but also for those uh, that are um, familiar with the work of Waters uh, to revisit his work. I think it is the right time to revisit his work, in fact, during these times, uh, through a reading of this particular poem, Afra and Amur, uh, which translates in English as Mass of the Dead. An epic poem, uh, indeed, not just in terms of its sheer scale, um, that is written uh, in the aftermath of the Hiroshima bombing, um, two decades after the Hiroshima bombing, in fact, in 1964, as mentioned already. The poem is considered by many as the single most ambitious long poem in modern Irish, and it forms part of his uh, collection of poetry, Lux Eterna in Latin, which translates as Eternal Light, Eon Fosh, published in 1964 in the Irish language. And this is also important because uh, Irish was the second language of uh, Eugene Waters. Afrin Murphy is important, in my opinion, for a number of reasons which cannot be fully uh, explored and covered in my talk tonight, but I am hoping that um, through our um, conversation, through our presentation, we will have the opportunity to be inspired by Waters' work and engage in conversations about the ways this modernist example of doku poetry is in dialogue with history, with its times, through the prism of the historical trauma it documents in the 20th century. A trauma that was inherited since World War II with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki following Hiroshima and the impact that events like these have had on the collective memory archive of the 20th and 21st centuries. Like the, likewise, the work uh, by Waters uh, can be read opposite so many literary traditions, as we will see, extending as far back as classical antiquity, medieval times, Ireland's history, and European continental European thought to reach our modern consciousness in the present COVID era to discuss many things, among them the role of literature, the role of poetry, to address human rights issues uh, right now. The poem uh, is memorably set over the course of a single day in a very Joycean manner. Um, it takes place on August 6th. 6th, 1945, the day that historically marks the bombing of Hiroshima. The speaker, like another Odysseus, has embarked on an urban journey in Dublin, haunted by the, the, the idea that he, along with everyone else he encounters on his wanderings through the city, are responsible for the catastrophe of Hiroshima. It is impossible to read the poem without this sense, this impression that you are a reader on the same quest with Waters and with his protagonists on an intimate passage that is as much autobiographical as it is archetypal and ongoing. My personal encounter with Waters and Afrin Amurv begins only a couple of years ago when Dr. Riona Nifrigil shared enthusiastically the poem along with an invitation to participate in a panel discussion at NUI Galway at the Ethical Conversation Series organized by the Republic of Conscience research team and the Irish Pages Journal. In my own academic work, I have always sought to explore critical connections between literatures and cultures, performances and theaters uh, at the intersection with classical adaptation and human rights discourse. So Waters text naturally sits at the center of my own interest, so to speak. But it became something more than that, like a sort of Ariadne's thread, generously unfolded many possibilities. A great deal of debt in the way I have since navigated my way around Waters's literary mind is owed to my interlocutors during this event. 
And uh, I want to uh, highlight um, the wonderful conversations I've had since then with uh, Professor Michael Macra, who has been very instrumental in uh, giving me so much information uh, on the work that Oturish Waters has done also on Greek tragedy. My reading is also indebted to Waters' translator and former pupil uh, Colbert Kearney for making the poem available in English to those of us who are regretfully known Irish speakers yet, and to this bilingual anthology mentioned by Paddy uh, at the beginning uh, of his introduction, which fittingly is titled Poems of Repossession, uh, uh, edited by Louis de Peur and published in 2016. I want to, I want to also warmly thank uh, Riona and Alicia who are with us tonight and are going to be reading parts from this poem in the original uh, in Irish and in English. Thank you very much for being here. My insights into Afro Namervsins have been also continually illuminated by an astute understanding about how little we know about Waters and his contribution to English literature inside and outside of the academy. It has also been amplified through my own ardent endeavors to translate some parts of this poem in my mother tongue in Greek for tonight's presentation the language that Waters was fond of translating in Irish. In the introduction to a special issue of the Poetry Ireland Review, which was published in spring 1985, paying tribute to Eugene Waters a few years after his death, Conleth Ellis highlights that poems like Afrina Merv and The Weekend of Dermot and Grace are ones that Irish students have neither been asked to study nor to memorize a line of. And Alice continues, its author in a letter to me a year before his death said, quote, it caused not the slightest ripple in home waters. It was as if it never had been, unquote. So tonight's revisiting of only a minute fragment of Waters' huge corpus of work undertakes the task of resisting this elision as an act of remembering, repossessing, and above all, getting acquainted and reacquainted with the writer and his craft 57 years since its publication of Afro and Merv. Uh, and now we will hear uh, some parts read by uh, Riona and Alicia. So tonight I'm going to read the third part of um, Ono Twirish's poem. I will read firstly in Irish and then in translation by Colbert Carney in English. The third part is titled Graduale, and that is, of course, um, a part of the traditional Latin uh, Requiem Mass, and it would have been traditionally chanted on the steps of the altar. So, in the section, this section of the poem, the poet or the narrator is on the steps of the city. And he begins by asking forgiveness for having um, uh, crafted his poem using the form of the Latin Requiem Mass. And then he goes on to consider the sheer scale of this tragedy uh, for humankind uh, and feels that we are all implicated in this barbarous act. Graduale. <clears throat> Na togara mechrius gunyarnas an gadiert is forum the chattel lin a yalwu the mashling buirch manama na beg im hasu er chemena na kara kesta kyon nacht is kushdu an gadiert shinya na marav for boss in ahtliye is an antra la grenye na blashfeme hejimar herashima. Ni gwil sin na hile de llinu ir is ever, ni ihiling and sperling e fwinu de vla yerdre, an trasha, kushlife an lingish, e green malehe, is lerdu ang min is arninu, shil ewe. Forgive me, Christ, that I committed theft, adapting the structure of your clear chance for my apparition. No small soul ache standing on the steps of the tormented city, bareheaded. I am troubled by the theft. We are the dead who died in Dublin in an evil hour, 
the sunlit blasphemous day we blasted Hiroshima. We are no longer goyles descended from Ear and Aver. We no longer think the tempest prepared for Dirdre's bloom was the end. At this time, beside the ship-laden Liffey in my days of decay, I clearly see our origin and our affliction, children of Eve. And I'm going to be reading an excerpt from the fourth and largest single section of the poem, Gius Ire, meaning the day of wrath. Uh, Gius Ire is originally um, the title of a Latin medieval poem that is best known for its use in the Catholic funeral mass or the Afrin the Marav. And th this part of the mass describes the day of judgment itself when the virtuous will be saved and the unsaved cast into the inferno of hell. So in this section of Oturish poem, the meaning of the original text of Gius Iri is reflected very well in his descriptions of a ruined, bedamned city of Dublin and its anglicised wasteland of civilization. As Hiroshima has been destroyed, so too have the inhabitants of Dublin who are culpable like the rest of humanity. The section that I will read in Irish and then in English as translated by Colbert Kearney tellingly ends in an apology to the so-called little sister, who we presume to be a personification of Hiroshima itself, and the name of whom little sister likely is an echo of the name of the nuclear bomb itself, little boy. Um, the apology is for the odious gift bestowed upon her from the black pool of human civilization and so-called progress. And of course, Blackpool is a play on the original meaning of Dublin city itself. Erai, Erai, Ahur. Shinya and Winchur, Ahogkul, Likinya. Triverla, Bristia. Shopi, Nasraja. Slincha, Britacha. Irsmi, Skalana. Nashakt Jangaha Bulcha Erklar Snavrak Shewal Tahta Joch Tabak Aran Agus Arklana Lidon and Dinya Tuna Shoulter Egon Ravlinya Shinya Namara for Bas in Aklia is an Antra the Vighim the Huan Aginya Er free of Hraj, free of Chahrach, Eg Bugadoch Bail, Ar Ginuan Aroin, Er an Tochraj, Lehul Haran Metropole, Ganar Juggy Neran Ruin Jewers, In Anyam, Namahar Chahrach Screefa, Sanyon Sullis, La an Echa, Eg Fasne Stuan, Ar Glichi Kincha. Maithdun, Mas Fedrishin, Nar Khuramar on Devlin, Lagra, the Dovraj Vin, Ferin Nisfar, Ahurin. Onward, onward again. We are the people who turned our backs on our own race. Through the broken English of the street shops, mangled surnames, vestiges, the shades of the seven languages printed on boards, floatsum of civilization, drink, tobacco, bread and theatres, the human litany through which we are sent in a glass coffin, we, the dead who died in Dublin in an evil hour of apathy, of mental slumber, on the main street of a capital city, stumbling straight into our destiny. On the daily funeral, past the metropole, not heeding the mystery written in the name of the mother city. In neon light, on the day of wrath, announcing our funerary games. Forgive us, if possible, 
that we did not send from the black pool with love for your smooth neck, a better present, little sister. Now I will begin my presentation. Eugene Rutherford Louis Waters was born in Ballinasloe in County Galway on the 3rd of April 1919 in the aftermath of the First, of the, of the, um, uh, first World War and the Easter Rising of 1916. His father, Thomas Waters, a cobbler, fought with the Connacht Rangers and was wounded at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. His mother, Maud Waters, was a seamstress. He was educated at the local national school and completed his secondary level education at the nearby diocesan uh, college in Garbali, where he came in contact with the study of Greek and Latin early on. This is where he read Plato, Euripides, Sophocles, Homer, Sappho, Virgil, Ovid, Horace, but also Shakespeare, Keats, Austin. Later on, he encounters, of course, Joyce, Yeats, Eliot, and Dante, who also had a profound impact on his work. He wrote his Greek and Latin translations into Irish. Kearney writes that waters found heaven in Garbally. He reveled in study, loved languages, and above all, loved Greek. In 1937, during World War II, the emergency, as it was called in Ireland, he won two scholarships to study in University College in Dublin and in Galway, but his limited financial means at the time did not allow him to pursue these degrees. Instead, he began studies at St. Patrick's Training College in Drumcondra in Dublin, where he qualified as a national teacher. And in 1939, he took up his first teaching position in Raffarnham, Dublin, while at the same time, he served as an officer in the Irish Free State Army between 1939 and 1945. During 1940, we know that he was involved in the recruitment and training of members of the local defense forces. In 1944, he graduated from UCD with a degree in English, Irish, economics and education. And three years later, he received his master's degree from UCD again with a thesis on Shakespeare's plays within plays. And here we see a portrait that uh, was painted by his wife, the artist Una MacDonald. Central in the development of his artistic uh, preoccupations and evolution was uh, his marriage uh, to Una MacDonald in 1945, the day also that uh, marks the Hiroshima bombing. And uh, here we see a photo of Una and Eugene that was taken uh, 76 years ago to this day uh, on the 10th of March. Um, so today it, it could be their anniversary. From the 1950s onwards, Waters wrote prolifically in both languages, in English and in Irish, and in a variety of genres. He wrote novels, plays, collections of poetry, including several works in English, as well as scripts for pantomime for the Abbey. And in 1961, he resigned from his teaching post to dedicate himself to the life of a full-time writer. Novels like Latak, historical novel, won him uh, numerous awards from the Lara Award to the Oriartas Prize and the Hyde Prize. From 1962 to 1967, he was the editor of Fiesta, the Journal of the Gaelic League. In 1965, with the sudden death of his wife, Una, he begins a period of introversion. According to Carney, within a year, Una was dead and Eugene, soon unrecognizable from the confident figure of the portrait, was about to spend some green years in the wilderness and Orpheus in search of his Eurydice, repeating with a new conviction a favorite quotation from Herodotus, to Theon esti thoneron, the gods are envious. And here we see a self-portrait of Una MacDonald. 
A year later after her passing, he completes and publishes Jalun to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1916, while the official symbol of the Rising's 50th anniversary year was the sword of light image that we see here on the left that was ubiquitous in the 1966 Golden Jubilee, and it was the winning entry uh, designed by Una MacDonald. Of course, this symbol has deep resonances uh, for the Irish people, and um, as, the, um, as the commemoration committee for um, the 1966 uh, Jubilee year uh, mentioned, uh, it was meant to represent intuitive knowledge, education, and progress. And these three words are very uh, important tonight in our talk because uh, they are at the center of Afro and Merv. Waters moved out of Dublin and returned to teaching in 1968. After five years of giving up writing, he returned to it in 1970. And in 1972, he married poet Rita Kelly. For the next decade till his death in 1982, he wrote and published prolifically. He gave lectures around Ireland. He is buried in his native Ballinasloe Law with his first wife, Una. On the tombstone that Waters had erected is engraved a daffodil and the sword of light with an inscription in Latin, which reads, Hic humus carissima quam habita verunt Eugene et Una, which translates as on this beloved soil dwell Eugene and Una. In terms of the structure of the poem, of the themes, and uh, of the very rich allusions and the intertextuality that it has, Afro-Namur sets off from a literary tradition quintessentially Gaelic and Catholic, but it is also simultaneously reflective of a decline in revolutionary optimism and ambition. As the poet argues, Waters writes his work as a sort of, quote, a late adaptation of European modernism, an Irish variant of ideas that dominated the arts, philosophy, and literature of continental Europe in the first half of the 20th century. Waters' intention was to implement these techniques of high modernism into the Irish language literary tradition, and in this respect, his writing stands alone. With a deep knowledge and commitment to writing in Irish and in English, Waters drew on a broad range of literary influences and traditions, ranging from the Bible to classical and Irish mythology and modern literature. The poem is 16 pages long and almost 600 lines long, and as mentioned earlier, is overtly rich in intertextual references and allusions, structurally and destructurally divided into nine parts derived from the Latin Requiem Mass, a Christian, Catholic, and Anglican text. In it, we find references that are religious, musical, philosophical, mythological, and literary uh, that describe the post-Lapsarian state from the Garden of Eden. We find Aphrodite, Europa, and Sappho to Virgil's Enate, Aeneas, and the Codex of Kells, Deirdre, John Scotus, Origena, to Richard Wagner and Friedrich Nietzsche, Dante, Joyce, Eliot, and Pound. A poem that it, in its episodic structure is acutely visual, reflected as a dense web of interlacing images that have strong narrative elements, effectively creating an expansive setting where the speaker's voice is built on a fragmented speech with a distinctive dramatical, rhetorical, and lyrical energy. Waters used to say, to write my drama as a poem. So he's very much influenced by this dramatization, this polyphony of voices that Eliot also uses. A lot of references and allusions. The language is heightened, the nuances of tone are somber, the dialectical oppositions juxtaposed to the incantatory rhythm Waters builds upon by subverting the constituent parts of the Catholic Requiem Mass, invent a setting that is at the same time obscure and familiar it is uh, like a vivid nightmare, but also a religious prayer for salvation. The nine parts of Afar and Merv um, are introitus in the introduction. The second part is Kyrie. The third is Graduale. The fourth is Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath. And in this part also there is um, another um, 
part that is uh, subtitled as Gaza per Undas, taken from Virgil's Enaid. Number five, hostias et preces, or sacrifices and prayers. Number six, we then it, he, sh he, she who comes, rather. Number seven, Danobis Pacem, grant us peace, a piece that is taken from Agnus Dei. And the last two parts, Lux Eterna, the eternal light. And the poem concludes with a requiem, which is a responsory piece instead of the Libera Man. Of course, Waters uh, subverts, as I mentioned earlier, the parts of the liturgy and he creates, uh, upon which he builds his poem. The action takes place within a single day in the unreal capital city of Dublin, August 6, 1945, the day Hiroshima was destroyed by a little boy, the world's first atomic bomb. Waters writes, the sunlit blasphemous day we blasted Hiroshima, unquote. Hiroshima is like a ghost and Dublin is the shadow personified as a young woman wearing a kimono. The layering of visions allows readers to perceive the journey in terms of a descent into darkness and the hell of modern civilization. Waters challenges the trope of the city, the urban capital as a shorthand for civilization and progress by having his protagonist alienated in a modern wasteland, amplifying the silence and making us aware of the torpor of the desert we, we are in, wearing childish masks, he writes in Kyrie. Before Waters introduces us to the eerie sunrise over Dublin in the first part of the poem, the introitus, that is reminiscent of a modern nuclear flash, he uses a twofold prolegomenon, a dedication to those who died at Hiroshima, Monday 6, August 1945, followed by an epigram by Dante Alighieri from La Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy. And this is also important, 2021, this year is the year of Dante, celebrating 700 years since his death. But in contrast to the Inferno or the Purgatorio, Waters opts for the following lines from Paradiso, which he uses to open his, his poem. Paradiso begins on Easter Sunday, at the top of Mount Purgatory, which is the earthly paradise or the Garden of Eden, and it forms the third and concluding part of Dante's work. So these lines set the tone of Waters' poem. To represent in words human transcendence is impossible, but let the example suffice for him for whom grace reserves this experience. The direct textual reference to Dante's allegory of his own journey through heaven, guided by Beatrice, operates as the overarching canvas upon which Waters reinscribes the itinerary of his own quest in Dublin. In the opening scene of the Divine Comedy, the reader is confronted with a very similar image, an ominous dark forest where the poet himself, Dante, is lost and tries to find his way out of the darkness guided by Beatrice. And there is also the ghost of the Roman poet Virgil, who is about to show him hell. Similarly, the opening memorable lines in Introitus grapple with this conflict, which is not just visual. Morning awakens our eternal unrest. I watch through a pane of glass the belfries of the children of Adam, our slates, our creed, our courts, floating in the freshness. Out of the mist, she bears herself to me, the immaculate maiden city in the act of resurrection. Morning awakens our eternal unrest. Το πρωί ξυπνά την αιώνια ταραχή μας. Πίσω από το τζάμι βλέπω τα καμπαναριά των παιδιών του Αδάμ, τα πλακόστρωτά μας, το δόγμα μας, τα νάκτορά μας, να πλέουν στην πρωινή δροσιά. Μέσα από την ομίχλη μου παραδίνεται άσπηλη παρθένα η πόλη στην πράξη της Ανάστασης. Το πρωί ξυπνά την αιώνια ταραχή μας. This first and last line that keeps recurring throughout the poem, like a chorus and a prayer in the Requiem Mass, ponders on the possibility of an apocalypse or doomsday as a result of nuclear war. Among the philosophers who had an impact upon his critical thought and writing was Plato. 
Kearney writes, in any exchange, Eugene was always conspicuous by his sense of a general pattern underlying the comings and goings of human history that gives form to the unaging lucidity which always seeks the timeless structure beneath the accidents of incidents. Both the inception and the reading journey undertaken in Afrinamur after Hiroshima emerge from the depths of the metropolis as from a modern platonic cave. Like Dante's Divine Comedy, the poem culminates in an ascent by the end. But before this takes place, the poem has to interrogate the legacies of the atomic age, faith, Western civilization, all of which he expressed in the context of the collective guilt of Ireland's neutrality during World War II. His ethical reflections on Hiroshima compel him to contemplate the role of the poet and poetry his own role as a poet and citizen in the modern atomic age. He writes, I walk through the accident of languages. I move forward musing out on the victory we achieved, the knowledge of good and evil in the will of rudderless man, a little god on his way from Kyrie. Perpatom mesa to atichima ton glosson. Prochoro me ti skepsi tu thriamvu pu petichame τη γνώση του καλού και του κακού στη θέληση του αμήχανου ανθρώπου, ένας μικρός θεός, καθοδόν. The poem captures acutely the paralyzing effects that traumatic historical events have upon the human psyche while building its subtle narrative based on the sweeping post-humanist cosmological and metaphysical scope of ethics. But an integral part of Waters' poetic over is the role of the poet as a religious agent, bringing together God and man in a transcendent platonic unity. In his letters to Can Grande, Dante refers to the notion of literature as write and writing as a morale negotium sive etica, whereby poetry can act as an agent of intellectual ethics of transcendence. It is this transcendence that is understood as an epiphany, a moment through which the self recognizes an ethical relation to others, or what French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas calls an encounter with an absolute or even divine other. Waters' response to these ideas, which were gestating in his mind for almost 20 years in ways unparalleled in literature. The philosophical underpinnings of these references are also based on ideas that Waters himself had developed in an essay he wrote in the Irish language while he was writing Afrinamur. That critical essay, titled in Latin Religio Poete, allowed Waters to develop his aesthetic theory, his own poetics, with an emphasis on the word religious and the priest-like role of the poet. The essay, which was delivered at the Shelburne Hotel, on, in Dublin on 23rd of November 1962, two years before the publication of uh, Lux Eterna, um, where P Waters talked about his aesthetic theory, setting off from the etymology of the word religio, which comes from the verb religare in Latin, and it means to bond together. It means that I bring together two separate things to create a bond, a connection, a unity. Water's quasi-platonic connection between two realities, forms and ideas, two principles between the visible, perceptible, concrete world and the abstract or unknown matter and form between human and the divine, the body and the soul, constitutes the poet's role. Halfway through the poem, in Hostias and Preces, or Sacrifices and Prayers, we have reached Purgatory, and Waters writes, The painter hides his face, wise man, from the glass, understands the flaw, and the man of tongues hides his face from the glass, recites a verse in Greek, to atone for what we have turned a blind eye to, since then, a glance at the truth, a poet. Ο ζωγράφο κρύβει το πρόσωπό του, σοφό. Πίσω από το τζάμι, καταλαβαίνει το ελάττωμα. Και ο άνθρωπο των γλωσσών κρύβει το πρόσωπό του πίσω από το τζάμι. Απαγγέλει ένα στίχο στα ελληνικά. Για να μα εξηλαιώσει από αυτό που αγνοούμε από τότε. 
μια ματιά στην αλήθεια, ο ποιητής. One of the central themes um, is uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an event that was in essence carried out in the name of the whole Western civilization. This feature alone urged Waters to universal questions of faith and mankind in the post-war, post-atomic world. In Kyrie, Waters prays for mercy to the Lord for the scientific lust of our restless generation and the filthy weather we created for ourselves. The reverberations of this unflinchingly resonant call sound very familiar right now more than ever. Waters also concludes with the following line, the nymphs slipped away from us. This was not the first time that Hiroshima, the Hiroshima bombing as a reflection on post-war Ireland and the world had preoccupied Waters' ethical vision of poetry. The Weekend of Dermot and Grace, published on the same day with Lux Eterna in 1964, is also highly autobiographical and preoccupied with the social and moral ramifications of the post-war era, specifically the sense of living in the post-Hiroshima world that is conjured up in the image of the victims of Hiroshima as human photoglyphs, which appears as a trope in both poems. Also, the, Dermot, the, the Weekend of Dermot and Grace begins with an epigram from Euripides Alcestis. In a letter to Richard Kell in 1965, Waters recalled the moment when he first learned about the catastrophe in Japan while on his honeymoon with Una. First newspaper for many weeks, whole page, the A-bomb, Hiroshima. We were on a train, bright August light through the window. I can still see the black headlines and the shock, as if I had been sleeping for years, jerked now awake. This turning point of being jerked awake after many years of sleep inside a platonic cave meant that the poet was now violently confronted with the atrocities humanity was capable of in the name of Western civilization of which he had considered himself to be a part of. In Dies Irae, the day of wrath, the poet's dirge continues in search of consolation, but the guilt-ridden speaker finds no refuge there either. A polite yawn from the fair maiden, her reflection shines in fitful sunlight, broken by rain lines inscribed on glass. I think of Aphrodite and Primavera. She brings in her beguiling mouth, the coral and pearl of the sea in which we live, half divine, half drowned. Ένα χασμουριτό ολοχάρι από την ωραία Παρθένα. Το είδωλό της λάμπει στο ηλιόφως που τρέμει. Διακόπτεται από τις γραμμές της βροχής στο τζάμι χαραγμένες. Σκέφτομαι την Αφροδίτη και την Άνοιξη. Στο απατηλό της στόμα φέρνει κοράλι και μαργαριτάρι της θάλασσας που ζούμε. Η μύθεη, μισοπνιγμένη. Waters' use of classical allusions and archetypes functions as a secular alternative subverting the religious narrative that undergirds the poem. It also dismantles the trope of the Irish-British binary by aligning his writing in Irish and in English with a broader European literary tradition. This could not resonate more with Ireland in its multi-layered negotiations between languages, identities, cultural and literary in a post-colonial and Christian Catholic context. Waters, however, displaces these cultural metaphors through a post-humanist critique, questioning received notions of progress, freedom and human rights in a post-World War II world, while the Irish Republic was declared in 1949. The post-war years that intervened during the gestation period of Requiem Mass, that is the decades from 1945 to 1965, and its publication are also crucial. For Ireland, the 50s and the 60s are eras that were marked by emigration and economic stagnation on the one hand, and on the other, the processes of modernization. Waters composes his work at the backdrop of Ireland's cataclysmic social, political, and economic transformations. Ireland is admitted to the United Nations during this time, and Dr. Walton, along with John Calcroft of Trinity College Dublin, win the Nobel Prize for Physics for their scientific breakthrough in splitting the atom. 
This is the time of the emergence of civil rights movements in the world and in Northern Ireland and the start of the troubles. This is also the era of the end of censorship and the provision of free post-primary education. So at the backdrop of all these historical events, this is a poem about post-Hiroshima memory also, but also about Irish history and ethical responsibility. A poem about the failings of Western civilization and science against the high hopes of humanism, but also a poem about others as it is about the self. It is a poetry that directs the gaze inwards and is at the same time far reaching outwards to include the world. And although the action is set in Ireland's capital, in Dublin, the treatment that Waters uh, has on his subject matter transcends the borders of Ireland and builds on connections that are much more ecumenical. In the post-war years um, and after the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Waters' writing demonstrates that he was compelled to actively serve what Gramsci calls the social role of the intellectual by questioning religion, civilization, and science in the atomic age and his country's neutrality during the war. Waters stood next to other Irish writers on this who had criticized Ireland's neutral stance, like Louis McNeese in his poem Neutrality and Dennis Devlin in Loch Dirk, which was published in 1946. But also we find traces of these ideas in Elizabeth Bowen's stories. Flann O'Brien coined the term abomic tomb to stress the moral bankruptcy of the modern nuclear age that resulted in the deaths of the people of Hiroshima. Waters unapologetically located the ethical role of the poet in the zone of ethical responsibility, addressing the relationship between writing and writing with an R and with, an, and with a W. These themes could not be more timely and topical now more than 50 years after, in the era of neoliberal economic warfare, global terror wars, population displacements, and refugees. The source of Waters' poetic dirge after Hiroshima is an ethics of confronting the, the other and the self. For this, I read Waters' post-World War II, post-Hiroshima ethical sensibilities, as echoes of the thought of Emmanuel Levinas, and I think it's important to dwell on the relationship that he has with the writing of Levinas, who was a, com a contemporary of Waters, a bit older than him, but also who published his books during the times that coincides with the time of the publication of Lux Eterna. He's also someone who refers to events such as the Hiroshima Levinas wrote about Hiroshima's bombing as initiating a transformation in our ethics. For Levinas, like for Waters, ethics is a panopticon, a way of seeing and a way of refracting the image. Similarly, throughout the Arthur Namur poem, the sight of Dublin is a specter that he gazes at through a pane glass as an apparition and writes, I regard again with present tense eyes making us aware of the torpor of the desert we are in. Levinas, like Waters, declares that secular messianic ideas are no longer possible, an argument in line with the intellectual climate, climate of the post-World uh, War II period as the end of history, scrutinizing the foundations of Western culture and time. Waters, Mass of the Dead, more importantly, pays homage to Levinas and a number of other philosophers and thinkers um, many voices who publicly oppose the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. It is thus indebted to Albert Camus, voices like Albert Camus, who published an article in the editorial of Combat on August 8th, only two days after the destruction of Hiroshima in 1945, where Camus condemns overtly uh, the advent of the atomic age as a discovery which primarily serves to unleash the most formidable destruction, a destructive rage that man has witnessed in centuries. In a world exposed to unbounded heart-rending violence, incapable of any control, indifferent to justice and the simple happiness of humankind, undoubtedly no one except through ardent idealism 
who dream of being astounded that science consecrates itself to organized murder. Years later, in 1947, another uh, Frenchman, Georges Bataille, wrote an essay entitled Concerning the Accounts Given by the Residents of Hiroshima, where he uses Protagoras' humanist motto, man is the measure of all things, but turns it on its head to write, the impossible is man's only measure. Other responses to Hiroshima as a marker of extreme brutality and moral failure include public intellectual voices like those by Jean-Paul Sartre and Jacques Derrida. Sartre famously intervened in three congresses of the World Peace Council in Vienna, Berlin, and Helsinki, where he advocated for building an international solidarity movement among nations that would oppose the escalating threat of nuclear war and that could ultimately restore political and economic sovereignty in crushed Europe. In the midst of the Cold War in 1955, Bernard Russell uh, and Albert Einstein, along with other signatories, issued the famous Russell-Einstein Manifesto, where they highlighted the catastrophic effects of nuclear weapons of mass destruction and invited world leaders to seek peaceful resolutions to international conflict urgently. It is impossible to imagine a more dramatic and horrifying combination of scientific triumph, the manifesto goes, with political and moral failure that has been shown to the world in the destruction of Hiroshima. From the scientific point of view, the atomic bomb embodies the results of a combination of genius and patience as remarkable as any in the history of, of mankind. One is tempted to feel that man is being punished through the agency of his own evil passions for impiety in inquiring too closely into the hidden secrets of nature. But such a feeling is undoubtedly defeatist. Science is capable of conferring enormous boons. It can lighten labor, abolish poverty, and enormously diminish disease. But if science is to bring benefits instead of death, we must bring to bear upon social and especially international organization intelligence of the same high order that has enabled us to discover the structure of the atom. To do this effectively, we must free ourselves from the domination of ancient shibboleths and think freely, fearlessly, and rationally about the new and appalling problems with which the human race is confronted by its conquest of scientific power. Undoubtedly, the mass of the dead is also in conversation with Alain René's film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, that was released in 1959, a film that intermixes real historical footage of post-war Hiroshima with a fictional love story scripted by Marguerite Duras, a forerunner of the docu-fictional genre in film. Irish filmmaker Paul Ekeho recently directed the film titled City of a Thousand Sons, which was inspired by the poem of, uh, by Waters Afrenamur, and it was produced as part of the European Capital of Culture Galway 2020, with filming taking place in Dublin and in Hiroshima in 2019. The film will also be screened in 2021 and it will be broadcast in Ireland by T.G. Cahar. In conclusion, uh, I wish to highlight the poem's profound affinity to peace activism and the contribution of Waters, who asserts the position of a spokesperson for peace and rights as what remains at the bottom of Pandora's box. As a powerful reply to Adorno's aphorism about the possibility of poetry after Auschwitz that could prevent catastrophes like Hiroshima and Auschwitz from happening again, Waters' work ends in affirmation in a sense, highlighting poetry's powerful role in this ethical mission. The poem culminates in the poet's room as a modern requiem of atonement. Inner peace comes in the words springing from the heart of darkness and the poetry returns to the source, he writes in the requiem. Η εσωτερική γαλήνη έρχεται με το λόγο που πηγάζει από την καρδιά του σκότους και η πίση επιστρέφει στην πηγή. Along with these words, I would like to conclude tonight's talk with the words of two Greek poets who, like Waters, wrote poetry after Hiroshima, confirming the intrinsic link between art and peace, rights and writing. And Paddy, 
uh, will do us the honor of reading the uh, original poems. In 1954, Nikiforos Vretakos published his unflinchingly condemning poem titled Letter to Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. I'm reading from the lines from the poem Letter to Robert Oppenheimer. How did that escape you, friend Oppenheimer? A sum of small and great miracles, man. The roads and the deeds of the universe begin with us and for us. Without order, how dared you, friend, friend Oppenheimer? Without consent, you're all complicit under the sun. Apospasma, aptopima gramaston Robert Oppenheimer to Nikiforu Vretaku. Possas the effie, file Oppenheimer, en as sinolo apomicra que megala thavmata. O anthropos, apomas que llamas, xequinuni o di, que ta erga tus simbandos. Joris endoli, pos tolmisate, file Oppenheimer, joris singatathesi, isaste oli paranomi, cato aptonilio. In 1965, a year after the publication of Lux Eterna, Waters' contemporary Greek poet Yanis Ritsos published his poem Hiroshima's Never Again in, Greek news in the Greek newspaper Avi. The poem was published specifically on May 22nd, the day that uh, marked the third marathon peace march that was held in Athens at the time. Ritsos anti-war poem commemorates the victims of World War II, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and expresses solidarity with Cyprus and Vietnam, calling for world peace and the creation of a united global peace movement. And along with Waters's uh, affirmative lines, I would like to conclude our talk with these lines from the poem of Ritsos. I do not forget the terrible cloud that buried Hiroshima. I do not forget the 200,000 dead of Hiroshima, 20 years have passed since then. I do not forget. I do not forget the monstrous threat against humanity and civilization. I do not forget Einstein's words, stop nuclear war before humanity returns to caves and arrows. I'm fighting for a ban on nuclear weapons, on rockets, on the means of mass destruction. I'm fighting for world peace. I am marching for the profound communication of man towards man. I am marching for progress, for happiness, for human freedom. I am marching for human dignity that learned how to walk among the stars. I am marching so that we can raise the flag of a peaceful earth on the stars. I am marching for world peace so that there are no more Hiroshima's ever again. Apton do decalogo Distritis Marathonias Porias, se pitiki apodosi yeni ritsu. Things ekno, to tromero nefos, pusavano se ti Hiroshima. Things ekno, tus diakosia kiliades ne cruz, tis Hiroshima. Perasan ikosi chronia apotote. Things ekno, things ekno, Tinteratodi apili catatis anthropotitas get to politismu. Then xecno ta loya to Einstein. Stamatiste ton birinico andagonismo. Brin i anthropi xanagirisun sta spilea casta toxa. Palevo yatin gatargisi ton pirinicon oplon. Ton piravlon ton meson mazikis katastrofis. Palevo ya mia sinfonia anamas estus laus. Odiporo ya ti vatia sinanoisi anthropu mantropo. mantropo. Odiporo ya tin brodo, tin eftichia, tin elefteria tu anthropu. Odiporo ya tin axio prepia tu anthropu 
που έμαθε να περπατάει ανάμεσα στα, στα στέρια. Ότι μπορώ για να στήσουμε τη σημαία της ειρηνικής γης πάνω στα στέρια. Ότι μπορώ για την παγκόσμια ειρήνη. Για να μην υπάρξουν ποτέ πια χειροσύμες. Thank you very much, Paddy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Natasha, for a wonderful, wonderful evening and a wonderful presentation. And thank you also to Riona and to Lisha, who gave the full power of the beautiful original Irish in this poem to us. Uh, you're free now, please, if you want to look at your chat buttons on the bottom of your screen to ask questions of our, of our, of our speakers. Um, and uh, you're, you're most welcome to ask any questions you may have. This is a, this is a remarkable poem and um, I feel uh, very strongly attracted to it. I came across this poem actually in Tokyo in uh, the mid 1990s. And um, strangely enough, uh, as a child of the 1950s, I feel I've been following a little bit in, in uh, Waters or Autorisch's footsteps because he, he, he went to St. Pat's and John Condred to be a teacher, uh, to be to, to trained to be a teacher in 1937. And um, I arrived there in 1958, 21 years later as a guinea pig, because there was a school attached to St. Pat's and Drunkondra, which had two sections. One was a large city school, supposedly, and the other was the small country school, which was a school lawn regia, although that term, I don't know if it existed at the time. But uh, I sus strongly suspect that that own Oturisk uh, taught in the classroom where I sat in the late 1950s and uh, 1960s. Uh, because uh, as, as small boys, we used to uh, be absolutely astonished at all these young men coming in, and they were all men. There were no women in St. Pat's in those days. <laughs> now it's the other way around. <laughs> and uh, we used to admire the enormous Adam's apples on these young men, whatever it was about them, the particular age they were at. <laughs> but um, at, at around that time, um, 1958, when I was going into to the National School and discovering that my real name was Paul de Gaubrodine, um Frank Aiken, uh, was in the United Nations, as, as Natasha has mentioned. And one of the, Frank Aiken spent a lot of the year during the, during the period of the General Assembly, Frank Aiken went over to New York as, a, as Minister for External Affairs, as it was then called, and he proceeded to, to deal with things from New York. And one of the things he brought in was the Irish Resolution. And he worked extremely hard on it, as did the mission, the permanent mission of Ireland to, to the United Nations. And 10 years later, Ireland was the first signatory of the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And that was one of the reasons, in fact, why Ireland opened an embassy in Moscow. Because the, Ireland, as the first signatory, signed this treaty in all three depository cities, Moscow, Washington, and London. And at all of the review conferences of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Ireland is the first country to speak. People in Ireland may not be aware of that, but we are in a unique position in this country to actually do something about what Oturisk's poem is about. And the, the, the terrible uh, fact that for all our scientific discoveries, for all the fact that we can send a, a, a vehicle up to Mars and send back pictures, uh, what we have really uh, uh, managed to do is, is uh, manage to produce machines which can destroy uh, the whole planet, the whole beautiful planet, uh, many, many times over without even thinking about it. Uh, one, one of the stranger things which I had to do uh, working as, a, as an Irish diplomat was on my first posting uh, in Bonn, in Germany. Bonn was then the capital in the late 1970s. And I attended uh, in 1979 and in 1980 the largest military maneuvers that had been held in Europe since the Second World War. And having hardly ever seen a gun in my life, <laughs> here I was flying around in enormous helicopters, um, looking at vast numbers of tanks and looking at machinery which could send some beautiful thing called a tactical nuclear weapon. Only a baby one you understand, but a nuclear weapon all the same. This was astonishing stuff. The numbers of people involved, 60,000 troops. This was on an enormous scale. Subsequently, I came back and worked, as it happens, in the disarmament section of the political division of the department and learned uh, about how much Ireland had invested 
in getting rid of weapons of mass destruction and particularly uh, nuclear weapons. And subsequently, I worked after a posting in Athens, I came back to work um, again in the area of disarmament and uh, non-proliferation. There is a distinction, by the way, between um, abolition of nuclear weapons and non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And the Irish idea was to try and, uh, as a, as a stopgap, pending the, the ridding of the world of these weapons to make sure that they didn't spread. And that was the whole basis of the treaty. And the nuclear weapons states agreed solemnly in this treaty, which is one of the widest, most, most, most signed treaties in the whole world. They agreed that they would not give the bomb to anybody else, but they, that they would transfer the technology involved in, in, in nuclear matters to the non-nuclear weapon states. And unfortunately, 50 years later, the nuclear weapon states did not live up to their promise to negotiate the, the, the ending of nuclear weapons. So Ireland and a number of other states, very few, by the way, from the European Union, apart from Ireland, decided recently in the last few years to negotiate a new treaty, which is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Because the, the, the NPT, although it has great advantages, it doesn't actually, it did not actually succeed in convincing the nuclear weapon states to divest themselves of these horrible weapons. And it's a very strange and maybe not a coincidence that the five permanent members of the Security Council in the United Nations all happen to be nuclear weapon states. So they have this little club of their own, all five of them, and they are adamant that they do not want to get rid of their nuclear weapons, despite the fact that they signed a treaty which came into effect in 1970 to get rid of them. <laughs> so on the 6th of August, 2020, during the middle of the lockdown last summer, uh, was the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of uh, the bomb on, on Hiroshima. And Ireland on that day deposited its instrument of ratification of the new treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. What can we take from this evening's wonderful, wonderful presentation and wonderful, beautiful readings in, in, in a poetic language like Irish and hearing Irish poetry and Greek poetry at the same time is a wonderful experience. What, what can we as citizens do? We can defeat our destruction through poetry and through civil society, through engaging and saying to the people who own these weapons and who threaten to use these weapons that this is not acceptable. And why is tonight of all nights so important? Because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're threatened by climate change, despite all the deniers. And I think people's sensitivity has woken up. They have plenty of time at the moment to discover that the world, we only have one of them and there's not another one around the corner and we have to look after it. And I think something small, the seed need only be a small seed to persuade people that their voice matters. And if something is unacceptable, it can make a difference. It has done so in the past. I was involved uh, during, during my time uh, in, in, in get, trying to get rid of weapons of mass destruction in, in an area similar to it, getting rid of uh, anti-personnel mines, which many countries were making a fortune exporting to countries who couldn't afford it. And it was successful because people would not stand up to it. And Ireland is in a unique position because we don't use these weapons. We didn't use landmines and we don't use nuclear weapons. And we have an amazing history as being the, 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 the people who passed, who, who, who worked for the Irish resolution and who signed the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Agreement, and who are at the forefront of the new treaty to get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. So it, it's been a fascinating evening. And I would like to thank uh, Paddy, Dr. Natasha Nerondo, please. Paddy, sorry to interrupt you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have two questions. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Excellent. And uh, I would like to just uh, have the opportunity to respond to that before we say good night to our viewers. Um, I see here Belika Andonia Kubarelli asks, is Lux Eterna translated and published in Greece? It is not. Uh, certainly not. In fact, uh, uh, one of the reasons why this poem hasn't been very widely distributed is because it, it is not published so often. And that's why this book is very important. And uh, this bilingual um, book translating um, 
uh, Irish poetry in English. Uh, it, it doesn't exist in Greece for sure. And in fact, uh, if we look at the publications um, like the Oxford Handbook of British and Irish um, War Poetry in English, uh, there's only a handful of people that are referred to and uh, certainly not many uh, are included there that responded to uh, the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing. There are references, for example, to poems that respond to the Blitz uh, uh, or to Britain, but certainly poems that deal with something that is outside of Europe are very, very few. And that is why uh, I chose uh, Waters as the, at the focus of our discussion today, because um, his poem is radical in so many different ways. And one of them is because he uh, decides to talk about Hiroshima. One other question above, mm -hmm. I, I, excuse me, I don't remember the name, I cannot go up. It says, why is there this interval of the two decades it's, it's such a great question. Um, from the point of the Hiroshima bombing to, 19, to 1965, when Lux Eterna is published, um, there are many, many, I think many, that is also connected to, uh, to this question of publication. Um, Autourish published most of his uh, work uh, after uh, the 50s. Um, so he comes into this generation of Irish writers that were very prolific and published their work at the end of the 50s, 60s. It was his uh, most creative period. Um, we, we know that he, he was writing this poem during this time, um, but he published it in 1964. So it seems like this idea was germinating in his mind for so long. And um, Possibly the, the upheavals of the times, also the 60s, that, that is so, um, you know, cataclysmic in Ireland, uh, in Irish history, also compelled him to uh, sort of publish it uh, then. Uh, and Rizzo's in the same way. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Rizzo's the same way. Um, he he um, took part in these marches in Athens and uh, he published... Uh, the poem in a newspaper. Um, and the same with um, Autourish, we see that there are two decades that elapse between the actual event and the publication, which is common to them. It is an act of commemoration, indeed. It has to do a lot with memory. Um, for example, it's in striking difference to what uh, French intellectuals, philosophers especially did, who responded to the event as soon as the Hiroshima bombing happened. But poems that deal with Hiroshima are very few. Um, and again, to go back to Rizzo's, uh, who wrote about Hiroshima and Vretakos, um, Rizzo's also translated uh, poems about Hiroshima by the Turkish uh, poet Nazim Hikmet and by the Romanian poet uh, Jebelian. Uh, so uh, there's a handful, really, of poets and poems written about Hiroshima. Uh, especially in Europe, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the Western world, outside of Japan uh, and Asia. Um, there are a few more uh, questions there, Paddy, uh, like we must, um, uh, sorry, uh, have nuclear weapons, uh, does Greece have nuclear weapons via the American bases? Uh, Stella wants to know. I think you are more... <laughs> I think that would be an ecumenical matter. <laughs> right. The fact is, most of our partners in the EU, our members, are also members of, of NATO with all that, that with all that goes with it. And um, Greece is is uh, very much um, involved in all things NATO. So I think draw your own conclusions. You know. Riona. Yeah, and Natasha, that was a wonderful, I mean, there are so many aspects of this that we we could uh, speak about, but just, uh, I wondered, because I, I believe that you've taught this um, on your course in Athens, and I, I wonder how, can you tell us a little bit more about how students respond to this, um, and how they find this text, and have you provided Greek okay. translations yourself, or do you look at the English, or how does that work? We haven't had the opportunity to talk about Afrin Amerv yet, but I have mentioned Waters in relation to um, uh, a version of Antigone that he wrote about that is called Michaelmas, and uh, Professor Makra, um, um, you know, imparted this uh, very crucial information to me because I, I work uh, extensively on Antigone studies. So it's, it's a version uh, of Antigone that is in Irish. 
and uh, Professor McCrary wrote an article on that, and it deals again with the Irish Revolution. Um, uh, they they don't know about him, uh, certainly. They don't know about uh, Waters, and I think that it would be a great opportunity for this um, tragedy. There are a lot of tragedies, in fact, in Irish um, that uh, are based on Greek tragedies, but they are in the Irish language that could be potentially translated, and one of them is Waters. I teach a course in, uh, in Antigone and uh, citizenship and ethics, uh, and it has come up in our discussions because we also um, talk a lot about the troubles um, uh, in the North of Ireland, the, in Northern Ireland, in the context of Tom Pollins, the riot acts. Um, so this is where uh, Waters has come into our discussion. But uh, Afrin Merv is certainly, I believe, a poem that should be included uh, in the canon of English literature next to um, you know, uh, epic poems uh, next to modernist poems like uh, The Wastelands and The Cantos by Pound. I mean, I don't see any reason why it is not included there. And I think this allusion is very crucial uh, to discuss also and something that I hope future researchers and scholars are going to, um, you know, put some more work in, in order to um, bring into the consciousness of our students uh, this poem. Yeah. I, I, um, Othorish was very clear that he wasn't writing for a general audience, he was writing for a learned audience and, and he felt that it was important to do this in Irish. Um, I think in you he has found the ideal reader um, and tonight's lecture showed us just the the richness of the text itself, but also the importance of an interdisciplinary approach and of um, a multilingual approach, if you like. Um, because you, you know, just the, the range of intertextual references and so forth. Um, it, it, it's, this is the sort of conversation that I'm sure he would have been gratified at the idea that this would happen. So congratulations, and I hope that we'll continue the conversation in the future. Thank you, Thank you very much for being here, uh, Alicia and Riona and Paddy. Thank you. And thank you to our uh, viewers, uh, our friends, and for the uh, very uh, interesting questions that they're asking. Thank you, Natasha, Riona and Leisha. I'd like in conclusion just to draw your attention to a wonderful book, uh, which you may not be aware of if you like uh, poetry in Greek and in Irish. Here you have in one volume the whole thing put together. It's a volume called Tana Barbary Echacht in You. And it was assembled with an introduction and notes by Owen Mac Egoin, uh, published by Cush Came. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And uh, we have previously in the Irish Hellenic Society had uh, readings in, in Greek and in Irish where Owen himself read his own translations of Kavafi. Finally, I'd like to introduce um, our very strange uh, sound art, which you heard at, at the introduction to our uh, evening. Uh, it's by the sound artist David Stalling, who is from Bochum in Germany, but he's living in Ireland for about 30 years. And uh, it, the piece is called Palace of Ships. And it was, um, it arose from his, his, his time spent in the Atlantic Ocean on the Irish research vessel, the Celtic Explorer in uh, 2018. And it involves listening to seismic recordings taken from three kilometers down on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. An array of um, sensors listening in to the earth and the earth as it, as it, as it groans under the weight of three, three kilometers of, of Atlantic sea. And that's what you'll be hearing uh, throughout this piece. He also, uh, slightly later on in the piece, you will hear where he has attached microphones to the structure, the steel structure of the uh, research vessel. Uh, and this uh, installation was shown in um, the handball alley in Inishir in September 2020. So you'll see that that's what the pictures are taken from. It's a, it's, it's, it's a sound installation and you'll see a number of the, the loudspeakers which, which he used. It's a 21 minute, not, not we're, we're listening to just seven minutes of it, but the full piece is 21 minute immersive audiovisual soundscape. And it was developed during investigations into sonic, seismic and cultural milieus of the Celtic Sea. The work uses field recordings captured during rough weather aboard the Celtic Explorer research vessel. 
sonifications of seismic data recorded in the Celtic Sea by the large Sea SACE array of ocean bottom seismometers and digitally altered spoken and sung experts, excerpts from the 8th century old Irish poem An Finimor Er Muig Lir, which describes a perilous journey during an ocean storm. Thank you very, very much to you all and good night. Kalispera says. Garmil Mahagi.